infrared wavelengths, and the images from NASA's WISE mission, the Wide Field Infrared Explorer, contain two billion sources. And which of those sources are the planet-forming disks? That's where we go to members of the public and ask for their help figuring out which of those needles in the haystack is a real planet-forming disk. No experience necessary. There's a short online tutorial. In about five minutes, you're looking at data, you're helping NASA, and you're potentially making discoveries. NASA has many satellites orbiting the Earth that look at clouds from above, but we need your help to make matching observations from below. By getting the perspective from both sides, we can have a more complete picture of what's happening with clouds in the atmosphere. Satellites see clouds differently than human observers, and NASA scientists could never be in all the places they would like to be to collect data from the ground, which is why we need your help making observations. So we've been traveling around the world using drones and this technique to map corals in 3D. And the, really the biggest challenge we have with all of this data is how to classify it. How do we get the basic number of how many corals there are, how they're doing as a function of changing ocean temperatures. And that's where NemoNet comes in. So we built a video game uh, that ties into our supercomputer and you can download it and, and play it on your iPhone or iPad device. And what you're doing in that game is looking at our data sets that we are getting from around the world with these drones and helping learn about corals at the same time as coloring them and feeding data into our supercomputer. On Planet Hunter's test, we use data obtained by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. So TESS is a space-based satellite that monitors the brightness of thousands of stars, and we need your help to find the planets within these data. In particular, we want to find the planets that the machine and computer algorithms tend to miss. So auroras affect our technologies on Earth and in the sky, um, in satellites, and they move really quickly, and it's important um, to get an understanding of what they're doing, and citizen scientists can really help with that. What kind of discoveries have citizen scientists made uh, with this project? So one big one is something called Steve, which is actually an aurora that can be seen further away from the poles than the usual aurora. It's very unusual. It kind of looks like an airplane uh, condensation trail, but with a photograph, you can pick up these amazing colors as well. By studying it further with satellite data and other data from the ground, we've discovered it's, it's really like a flow-driven aurora. It's an east to west flow that is lighting up the sky and doing some amazing kind of new, unusual aurora, um, auroral activity that's still being um, studied now. We astronomers thought that disks stopped forming planets after about five million years, but then the citizen scientists at Disk Detective started finding objects that were able to form planets about nine or 10 times the age of the that so into the 40 and 50 million year old age range and uh you know the astronomy community is still trying to figure out what that means so it's pretty exciting because once you have all that data it really doesn't mean anything unless you have humans come in and help annotate what it is we're looking at to put it bluntly they're changing the world I mean, we have mapped as of 2020 around six percent of the ocean floor project in uh, in in 2006 I think we had like five teams participating. Now we've got over 3,000 teams from 80 countries around the world that are participating. Uh, citizen scientists are able to look at these images and see deeper into the images than the automated detection utilities. Those are important observations because they're finding things that are that are missed in the original in the original data. Hello, my name is McDonald Chirara and I've been part of the Globe Observer program which is part of NASA's um, Citizen Science project. I've been involved in this project for the past six months. I decided to participate in this project so that I get the opportunity to do something cool and interesting in my free time. 
please join us because it's a very exciting thing to be involved with, to be able to report and share what I see. I'm not a scientist, I don't have a great camera, I don't, uh, I'm not a professional, but I can be involved in something that's really important. And right now- Hey everybody, greetings from the Arctic. Team Hearts in the Ice saying hi. We want everybody at the SITSICOM to be super citizen science heroes. It's so much fun. Join in. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, what we call an interstitial video. That is just some entertainment for you and give you background about what NASA citizen science is all about. And hopefully you're as excited as we are to get started in about six minutes. I'm Darlene Cavalier from SciStarter and from Arizona State University. We're very happy to be partnering with the Citizen Science Association with support from NASA to help you learn more about all the ways you can engage in real science that needs your help. And so welcome to, for our lifelong learners. That's the, that's the point of this session. And when we say that, we typically mean people 50 and older, but everybody can be a lifelong learner. Hopefully you're joining us and awake. You still have a little time to sip on some coffee if you're on the West Coast or further out. Um, we're gonna get started with some sound checks and please stick around. You can hear some of our presenters. They'll be on screen, we'll do a sound check. And then I also want to remind our presenters and everybody that while you can post comments in chat, um, you, we really want you to use the Q&A function on Zoom. Ask questions of the presenters there. And presenters, please check for the open or unanswered questions and go ahead and start answering them at your pleasure. Thank you to everybody who is joining us from YouTube or Facebook. You can leave comments in both of those platforms and we have people who are specifically looking for your questions and we'll feed them up and try to get as many answered as possible. So let's go ahead, let's start with our sound check here. Who will be our first speaker? Is it Dorian? I believe it is me, greetings. Oh. greetings sound check Dorian. here, can good you, morning to you. It's great to see you. Would you mind, you. Um, let's see, can everybody see Dorian? Caroline, are you able to see Dorian? There you are. Hey, Dorian, nice to see you. Hello, good morning. Nice to see you too. Thank you. We're very excited for you to um, come on and tell us about GLOBE. And I'm excited uh, about it too. Excellent, fantastic. All right, Emily, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? We're doing great. Yeah, we're very excited about Snapshot Wisconsin. And I hear that you even have an interactive demonstration that our, our attendees can engage in. Yes, absolutely. I'm excited to share that with everybody and I hope everybody will log on afterwards. Yes. Yeah. That's the whole point here is to learn about it and then actually do these projects. And then Michael. Yep. I'm here. I can hear you loud and clearly. And Michael, you're such a special guest for us too, because Michael is a volunteer. He is a citizen scientist. So for everybody tuning in, we'll get to hear firsthand, or I guess secondhand, um, what it's like to be a citizen scientist from somebody who has been engaged in NASA citizen science projects. So, and Michael, do you prefer Mike or, or Michael? Mike is fine. All right. Well, Mike. I am over 50. <laughs> couldn't tell. Cannot tell. <laughs> nice to see you. And thank you for sharing that. I actually think that's an important thing to, to point out once again, because sometimes there's different approaches different strokes for different folks. And um, we've known from our work with the OSHER Lifelong Learning Institute and some others that we've been doing with training specifically for the 50 or the 55 and older community that um, sometimes technology can get in the way of you just having a great experience with these projects. And we don't want that to be a barrier. And so kind of walking you through these projects, step-by-step -step instructions, listening to the uh, project leaders, having a chance to ask them questions directly. By the way, also helps our, helps our project scientists. They don't often get to hear from you directly. So we're so appreciative that you're tuning in. And then of course, the icing on the cake with, with Mike joining us. And then I hear we have somebody joining us by phone, another citizen scientist. Is, is Larry on the line? Yes, indeed, Larry is on the line. 
Excellent, Larry. Thank you so much for joining us too. We can hear you loud and clear. Good. Thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. So I just want to remind everybody again, if you're tuning in from Facebook or YouTube, we're not going to leave you out of this. You can uh, post some comments there and questions for the, for the project scientist or for Larry and Mike. And our teams will do their best to make sure that they are aware that those questions exist. For our panelists, keep checking the open questions there and go ahead and, and answer them. They're usually directed specifically at your project, so that would be great. And for everybody else, go ahead, tell us where you're tuning in from today in chat. It's people actually from all over the world. This is great. It's so great to see all of you too. Um, all right, so in about two minutes, it sounds like, or should we get started? All right, we're starting the recording now. That's great. I also want to give a shout out to Caroline Nickerson and Tara Cox, who are behind the scenes. They are not behind the scenes for long. You'll see them hosting a series of other events. Welcome back for anybody who joined us yesterday. That was amazing. Jam-packed, lots of events. We heard about lots of amazing citizen science projects from NASA. We heard from really remarkable volunteers. Um, it really inspired me to get involved in some projects that, frankly, I did not think I would be able to do. I thought I needed some um, specialized knowledge for some of the projects. Later on today, you're going to find more and more sessions, sessions that are ideal for people who have telescopes or are thinking about getting telescopes and um, all types of projects. Las Vegas in the house, Brazil. Excellent. Yeah, I'm excited for day two also. All right, let's go. Let's go over some um General housekeeping, if you think it's time, Caroline and Tara. Looks like we have one minute till go time. All right. Okay. Well, and we are now at 11 o'clock Eastern. Excellent. Well, you probably heard this already, but welcome everybody to Sit Side Con Lifelong Learning Edition, a special presentation from SciStarter, Citizen Science Association, and NASA. Today's session is really aimed at our lifelong learners. And while anybody can be a lifelong learner, this is especially aimed at people who are 50, sometimes we say 55 and older. It's great to have you all here today. You're about to hear about some fascinating projects from NASA, supported by NASA, projects that actually need your help, projects that the researchers cannot answer questions without your help. Please don't be shy about ch chiming in in, um, in chat here. And then ask questions. If you have specific questions about the projects or you want to direct a question to one of the presenters, use the Q&A function in, in Zoom. Or if you're tuning in from Facebook and YouTube, welcome. You can leave comments there. We have people who are scanning those pages and we'll relay your questions back to our presenters. Let's get started here. A few reminders, the event is recorded and we record it so that we can share it with others who weren't able to tune in live. We also record it so you can come back and watch and maybe you didn't catch something the first time, don't worry, it's recorded. For everybody who registered through Zoom, we're gonna send you an email with a link to the recording and a link to these projects too. You can see us, but for the most part, we cannot see you. I can see my fellow speakers and presenters. So don't worry, you're not on camera. We also can't hear you. This is why the chat is important and the Q&A is important. This is how you're going to relay your questions and your comments and your, your thoughts with us. Again, Q&A function, that's what you use to reach the presenters and they're going to do their best to answer all of your questions. We're also gonna leave some time at the end for some q and I've said this again and I said it already, I'll say it again. If you're joining us from YouTube or Facebook, go ahead and leave some comments especially we wanna hear if you have some questions and no question is too silly. We do have a hard stop at 11.50, so we're gonna get started. We're here to have fun, that's the best thing to tell you. Relax, have fun, learn about these things, and we really want you to engage. That said, we also have people tuning in from all over the world, but with varying experiences. So just remember, we wanna have something for everyone at the same time, we may have experts tuning in, people who are very familiar with citizen science and maybe you've even been published on one of the peer reviewed papers. And we also have people who are brand new, brand new, maybe even to Zoom tuning in. So let's be patient with our varying um, expertise. And again, the name of the game is to have fun here. So let's see who is joining us today. Here's a poll that's up. Go ahead and answer it. I believe you can have multiple answers here, but 
are you a citizen scientist or an aspiring citizen scientist? They technically should probably be two questions, but hopefully everybody fits into that category. Are you a student? I've actually seen some students tuning in here in chat. Welcome. Are you a parent of a citizen scientist or an aspiring citizen scientist? And we should add here possibly a grandparent. I know my in-laws and my mom is tuning in. Uh, my mom's also a great grandparent, so we can add that there too. Uh, library or museum staff or another facilitator within an informal educator. It's a lot of words there. We're basically asking, are you somebody who helps bring these programs to audiences? And if you are, thank you. Same with the educators is our next group there. You're extremely important to citizen science. You help us to connect to people that we typically can't reach without your help. So thank you. Are you other? And if so, you can share in chat what that means exactly. Oh, hello, everybody saying, well, Jennifer's saying hello to Darlene's family. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, let's see what we have here. Citizen scientists or aspiring citizen scientists, that makes sense, followed by students, welcome students, formal educators, that's great. And we'll have to take a look at what the others are too. Let us know in chat. So thank you. We, your wish is our command. If you're an aspiring citizen scientist, we hope to get you involved. Soon, very soon. All right, have you participated in citizen science before? Yes, and is that for more than a year? Is it less than a year? Maybe you've never participated yet, welcome. And you might not be sure. I bet many people may not be sure and it's possible by the end of this, you, you start to realize that you may have actually participated in citizen science before, especially our ornithologists and people who use telescopes. So let's see, go ahead and answer the call. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, mom. Hey, Ron. All right. Not sure. A couple of us. Okay. The majority of you have not participated. If I'm adding this up right, well, the minor majority of you have not participated, which is great. If we combine them more than a year and less than a year, that slightly outweighs it, but welcome. This is good. All right. Let's get started. Oh, my sister's tuning in too. Hey, Mark. All the way from the UK and Bart. Okay, I can't go through the whole list, but thank you friends and family for tuning in here. Today, our presenters include Dorian from Globe Observer. Actually, we're just gonna get started right away with Dorian. Dorian, you wanna take it from here and tell us about your amazing project? I suppose I can do that. Let me turn on my video, make sure you can see me okay and you can hear me okay. Are we in good shape? Yes, excellent. All right, well, good morning. And it is my pleasure and my honor to be here. I am joining you today from Maryland's Chesapeake Bay. I'm on the shore here. And this is very apropos as uh, today, the deep dive that I'm going to be doing is going to be into mosquitoes. I just want to start though by telling you a little bit about who I am. I am a lifelong learner. I um, am 63 years young and I was a formal educator for over 30 years and lived to tell about it. And now I support the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission at Goddard Space Flight Center. And I also have the honor and the privilege of working very closely with the GLOBE program as a GLOBE educator and also on the GLOBE um, working group. And I support the GLOBE Mission Mosquito Campaign and the Trees Around the Globe Campaign. So here's what I wanna to talk to you a little bit about today. So many of us have regular contact with the world's most dangerous animal, which is not the shark or the giraffe or the lion or even humans. It turns out that the common mosquito, and this is of course a model, a large model of the common mosquito, the mosquito happens to be the world's most dangerous animal because more people around the world are, are sickened by mosquito transmitted, oh, go away. <laughs> That's not a mosquito, but it's certainly an annoying fly, um, but by the world's most dangerous animal by, by mosquitoes. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about mosquitoes and show you how using simple smartphone technology and a very, very easy and free app. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. It's called Globe Observer. You download this for free. The first time you download it, it's gonna ask you for your email address. Then it's gonna send you a passcode. That's the only time you're going to need to enter your passcode. After that, every time you open up, it's gonna open up and be ready to go. You also do not need to have internet connectivity for the Globe Observer app to work or to gather data. Basically, you just need your internet connectivity when you're entering your data. So 
I already went ahead and told you the world's most dangerous animal happens to be the mosquito. And if we go to the next slide, I'm going to be walking you through this video that shows a gentleman who is a lifelong learner who is using the app. We won't have the sound on this because it's just basic, some, basically some loud music and you can go ahead and start, but I'm gonna talk you through it because I think it just does a great job of telling the story. So once upon a time, a gentleman was sitting and enjoying reading his book on a park bench and he got bitten by a mosquito. Well, he knew that if you're bitten by mosquitoes, they don't travel very far. The chances are the mosquitoes have larva and a mosquito has laid eggs somewhere close to where you are. So this gentleman goes over, he has his app ready to go. He picks Mosquito Habitat Mapper because he's found some standing water. Even if there are no mosquitoes in it, even if it's February, you can go ahead and show that this is a potential mosquito breeding habitat. Now he's looking to try to decide what type of breeding habitat is it because that's important. In this case, it's artificial, it's human made. It looks like it's a, an old planter. And now he's going through and he has some choices to make. So he's decided it's an other and he looks through and you pick the one that most closely matches what you're looking at. So he says it's an old flower pot. Now he's just gonna click and take a picture. You'll notice in this case, we're not doing selfies. You basically just wanna take a picture that doesn't include any humans, but that shows what that water source is. Then I like to go a little bit more cl close to the water source and get a close up picture just to show, are there any larva or pupa? Now, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what larva and pupa are. He looked and saw there was no uh, larva or pupa in that water. So now he's just writing, oh, I see that it's just a empty flower pot, no larva present, which you don't actually have to put that comment in, but you can. And now this is super important. He is eliminating the potential mosquito breeding habitat. Of course, you can't always do that. But chances are, if it's a human created mosquito breeding habitat, that you can. So basically, those are the steps for being able to help us to reduce the threat of the world's most dangerous animal. And if you'll go to the next slide. Um, so on this tool, I mean, on this app, so we call this the Globe Observer app, we have four tools. Each of these tools has directions built in. They're easy to use. And something I really want to emphasize is that you can't break this. You won't hurt anyone's research. Um, we know how to look through the data. And we also have, have these data so that they're collected in a way that's very systematic and gives us the data we need. Here's an example of that. With clouds, and this walks you through how to do it, you will take your smartphone or your iPad and you'll be aiming it about 14 uh, degrees off the horizon. You don't have to do any of those measurements. It's basically like a game. There'll be a little circle that comes up in your phone and says, say, northeast, southwest, up or down. And then right when you're in that circle, it will take the picture. With all of these, our big ask is please don't take pictures of people because we want to maintain confidentiality. So we have the clouds tool. We have mosquito habitat mapper tool land cover tool and trees tool. I will, when the next speaker comes on, I will post in the chat box some what I call uh, resource packets. And I actually created these when I was working with lifelong learners. I was working with a group of lifelong learners and we had six hour and a half sessions over a six week period. And it, it came to me that it was super important for them to be able to have some resources to look at after and before our class to better understand why is NASA interested in mosquitoes, land cover, clouds, trees. So I have a whole section you'll be able to visit that talks about the ways in which NASA gathers that data. I'll also have some links there where you can go to find some neat multi-generational guides, activities that you can do, videos, and even you can join if some of these you, you, you say, wow, I'd love to learn more about trees or I really like to learn more about mosquitoes and how I can help 
reduce the threat of mosquito transmitted disease. We have some field campaigns and we have regular webinars and kind of a, a network of people who collaborate with each other. And you're always invited to join us with those. So I will be posting the links to those story maps or those resource packets. And there's one for each of these tools for your learning pleasure. So I do hope that you will seriously consider um, downloading the Globe Observer app and playing with it, having fun with it, learning from it. And um, if, if you collect data and it ends up that you, you hadn't meant to take that picture or you're not quite sure if you have it exactly how you wanted it to be, don't worry. We go through the data, we take out the data that, that isn't useful. And it is so important to us to be able to collect data from all over the world, from the ground, to use to compare and contrast what our Earth observing satellites are collecting from the sky. So when we put those two sets of observations together, it gives us an incredibly rich data set through which to better understand our, claiming, our, our changing climate, uh, humans interaction with, with our Earth, and also gives us a better understanding of what we can do and are doing to improve sustainability. So. I thank you very much for your time this morning and I'll be on the lookout for questions. And I will put those links in the chat window. Fantastic, Dorian, that was an amazing explanation as we've seen in chat here. And I even see some people who say, I can do this and 100%, you can do this. Um, Dorian, there are some specific questions for you in the Q&A in the open tab. So I'll let you get at some of those questions. Sounds and, like a plan. Um, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Dorian, that was fantastic. My pleasure. All right, now we have Emily. And Emily, I'll let you introduce yourself and your project and show us how we can get involved. Great, thank you. Yes, my name is Emily Biggie Donovan. I'm a research scientist on the Snapshot Wisconsin project. And we are a citizen science-based trail camera monitoring project. And I thought um, the best way to introduce it would be to have a really brief slideshow of some of the animals curation of photos that we've seen. Originally, I was going to be silent, but I see we have people from all over the world. So I'll just identify the animals as they go. So if somebody can hit, um, yeah, perfect. So that was uh, black bears. This is a cougar, bobcat, and a coyote, sandhill crane, the deer, white-tailed deer, fisher, gray fox, otters, the otter family, a raccoon, a striped skunk, beautiful turkey photo, a wolf, an elk, and a couple of red foxes. So as I mentioned, we are a citizen science-based trail camera monitoring project through the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. We have two major goals. First is to engage the public in hands-on learning experiences for, through natural resources. And the second is to collect data needed for wildlife management decision-making. Today, I'm going to give you a, a very brief overview of how we collect the data and what we do with it. And then I'll focus on how you can get involved. So next slide, please. So this is the state of Wisconsin. We have it divided up into a little over 6,000 survey blocks. In an ideal world, we would have one camera operating in each one of those survey blocks. But if you hit um, next one more time, please, this will show where we are right now. So all of those orange blocks are where we have at least one camera operational. Um, now, uh, again, a very brief um, couple of examples of what we do with the data. If we hit next just one more time, it'll bring up a few photos. So again, just a few examples. Um, so first is uh, the first picture and, and the top there is of white-tailed deer fawns. So uh, fawn to doe ratios is something that we've been um, calculating with the data for quite some time now. So it's important to understand how many fawns each doe or female deer has on average so that we can understand better how across space and throughout time the new deer recruitment might change. Next is elk 
monitoring. So in the background map, you see the blue areas as our elk reintroduction areas. Elk were removed from the state quite some time ago, and then over the past few decades have been uh, reintroduced to the state. So we have a higher camera density in those areas to keep extra close attention to what's going on with those elk throughout the state. We've invested lots of resources. We want to know where are they spending their time? How's the population doing? And finally, another example is uh, wolf monitoring. So this is a species in the state that is of great management interest. We do have on the ground wolf surveys where people go and look for tracks on the ground, but some areas of Wisconsin are very, very remote and difficult to survey. So we use the trail camera data to kind of supplement those surveys and then we can create the most complete picture possible. So again, these are just some examples. Uh, next slide, please. So on the right, I have a pie chart here that shows the breakdown of the types of animals that we see. About two thirds of our photos are of deer. And we recently achieved a milestone of 50 million photos collected. So not only would we not have those photos, but we wouldn't know what's in those photos if it weren't for all of our volunteer effort. So of course we have lots of people in the state of Wisconsin who are managing the cameras for us um, and uploading the photos, but a huge effort comes from our global audience. So uh, that map on the bottom there shows uh, where we've had folks log on to classify photos from across the whole world. Uh, and so this is something that you can do from wherever you are. So next slide, please. Um, so I have two sites that I'm going to show. I'm going to share my screen in just a moment here. Um, on the left, I have a screenshot from snapshotwisconsin.org. Don't worry, I will drop these links in the chat once I'm done here so that you don't have to write them down or remember it. But this is our crowdsourcing website. So this is where you go on, you can classify photos, again, from anywhere in the world and contribute to data collection. That's where I'll spend most of my time in my demo. I'm also going to show a very brief uh, demo of the data dashboard. So if you're um, kind of a data nerd and you like to look at, uh, at the data and, and kind of explore it, this is a great place for you. So this is kind of a place to go and look at the fruits of your labor after you've been classifying. So I will go ahead and share my screen. Oh, it says I can't share it until other, here we go. Alrighty, okay. So this is snapshotwisconsin.org. This is uh, our crowdsourcing website hosted through the platform Zooniverse. Um, now, uh, we highly recommend that you create an account so that it keeps track of your um, classifications and you're not accidentally served the same photo twice, um, et cetera. It'll also allow you to chat. So I will show you how that works. So I'm logged in here. I'll go to the classify tab and I'll be randomly served a set of three photos. Our photos are taken in, in bursts of three. So I hit play down here and we see that there's a white tailed deer moving down here and I don't see that it has antlers. So I'll click deer and I'm going to click one antlerless deer. And then we also have an optional behavior question for elk and deer. Um, it's moving. Sometimes these are difficult to answer, so that's why it's optional. I'll click identify, and then for this example, I'll just click done, and I'll get served another set of uh, three random photos. So here, it's a little blurry, but I'm uh, pretty well versed in identifying blurry tra trail camera photos after my three years on the project. Um, so I can tell that this is a snowshoe hare. However, if I didn't know, I can click on the field guide over here, and I can explore. So I know that it's a lagomorph or I can't, you know, maybe I didn't know if it was a snowshoe hare or a cottontail rabbit. Those are two main species of um, lagomorph in the state. And here I can look at pictures and read some more information that might help me identify. So you can do this even if you don't have any um, experience with Wisconsin's animals. So I'll go to the snowshoe hare uh, button. I'll click how many, one, no young present and I'll hit identify. Once I've done that, I can either hit done again and get served more photos or I can hit done and talk. This is where if I wasn't sure about my classification, I do have to make a guess before I can get to this page. But if I wasn't totally sure, I could say 
you know, I think this might be a snowshoe here, but I'd really like somebody to confirm for me. Or um, maybe it was just a really cool photo and I wanted to just share it with everybody else. If I put my thumb in here and hit add comment, I'll show you where those comments are populated. So here I hit talk. If I go to the notes section, this is where everybody's sharing photos. Um, this is where it, it will pop up. So you can see people have been active this morning. I'll just click on this first one as an example. This person wasn't sure about their classification. They said, I guessed it was a Martin, but I can't really tell. It's, it, and this is kind of a difficult photo to tell. Uh, here, one of our moderators jumped in right away and said uh, that th she thinks it is a red fox and then gave a description of why she thought it was a red fox. And then the person said, great, thanks. You can also search through these popular tags. So if you find a really great bobcat photo, you can share it with hashtag bobcat. And it'll show up in this curation of a collection of bobcat photos. And then you can search through them as well. So if you want to see more examples of a particular species, you can check out those tags. There's also a ton of other information here, um, a little video that introduces you more information about the state, um, some photos of the team and what we do, etc. So that is the uh, snapshotwisconsin.org Zooniverse page. Now if I jump over to the data dashboard, again, this is separate, not necessary to participate, to visit this. But I noticed from the poll that we had a lot of educators or a fair number of educators in the audience. This is a great place to go if you want to incorporate um, some of the snapshot data into the classroom beyond just the Zooniverse page. So uh, here we have a list of species. You can click on a different species and it'll update. Um, all of the photos of Bobcat that we've uh, identified will show up in this map and this graph here. So we can see where they are spatially throughout um, the state. And we can look at when they're most active. I'll just flip back to bear here. Um, and we can see that there's a really strong trend for bear in the northern part of the state and not so much in the southern part of the state. We can also flip over to um, looking at the data by month. Black bear in the state of Wisconsin hibernate in the winter. So in January, February, March, we don't see a lot of bear activity. And then the activity increases through the summer and back down once we get towards the winter again where the cycle starts over. I'll just point out uh, really quickly that there's also this download data button. So again, if you're an educator or you just wanna dig into the data a little bit more uh, deeply, you can download it and answer your own questions and kind of experiment. So this is a fun place to go, data-dashboard.snapshotwisconsin.org um, just to kind of play around. All right. So that's all I had for Snapshot Wisconsin. Again, I will drop those links in the chat. Um, feel free to uh, ask me any questions in the q and I'll try to answer them before the end of the session today. I'll also drop our email in the chat. If you have any additional questions that I'm not able to answer, um, you can always send our team an email. So thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. And I'm excited to see you on the chat boards. That was great, Emily. Yes, there's some questions for you or comments in chat. And I wanna remind everybody again, your questions for the panelists should go in the Q&A. Use the Q&A tool in Zoom. It's a lot easier for them to find your questions there. But I'm loving everything that we're seeing in chat here. Emily, that was a great job. Thank you. Thank you. OK, and as a reminder, too, you can find more information about upcoming sessions and all of the projects, all the NASA Citizen Science projects and resources at SciStarter.org forward slash NASA. And thank you for all of the people in chat who have been reminding others about that, too. All right, let's see. Next up, we have Larry. Larry is joining us by phone, and Larry is going to tell us about his experience as a globe observer. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Darlene. Uh, hello, my name is Larry Fizz, and I'm from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. I am 62 years, also young. As a citizen scientist, I go outside at certain predetermined times of day. Uh, these predetermined times of day are based on satellite overpass schedules. I go to GLOBE, I enter in my precise uh, geographic coordinates, and it gives me uh, an overpass schedule so I know exactly when to go out and observe because 
the overpass schedule tells me what time of day satellite is directly overhead. So by way of these observations, I look at the sky, look at the ground, take notes, and I share observations with the NASA scientists by way of a standardized online data entry form. I also find that at the GLOBE website. So I have already had people ask, why are you doing this? They'll see some old guy in the middle of a park and lot looking up in the air, writing stuff on a notebook. I ask him not to call the police. No, I'm just kidding there. Um, but my answer is there's no question that human uh, activities are having an influence on our planet, but there's never a really solid question as to how much. Uh, and it always turns out to be someone's opinion. Well, it has an impact, but it doesn't have that much of an effect on this or that. Well, NASA scientists who are certainly educated and dedicated people are interpreting data that they receive from Earth orbiting satellites, very precise, very accurate data, and they are using actual measurements. So there's no estimates or there's no uh, conjecture as to the condition of the atmosphere, which clouds certainly play a part in. They make actual measurements, they establish trends so that they can understand how the atmosphere, whether it's changing or just the condition of the atmosphere. But it turns out that NASA scientists, as resourceful as they are and uh, as accurate as the information they have, they really can't do it alone. They need help from citizen scientists. They need help by way of ground-based observations that helps supplement their, their data because scientists are limited literally by their perspective. It's an over, overhead looking down. They can zoom in certainly, but their perspective is always overhead looking down and they need uh, some ground-based observations to help them. It helps them validate the re satellite retrievals. It helps them refine and improve uh, the interpretation that they make of uh, the measurements from the satellite data. So what exactly do I do? What exactly do citizen scientists do with making ground-based observations? Well, Again, I mentioned from the sat from the uh, GLOBE website, I get a satellite L overpass schedule. I go out a particular time of day, and I've been trained on the clouds protocol in the atmospheric section of GLOBE. And what I do is I make an estimate of total cloud coverage, and I also make an estimate of cloud height, whether it's low or mid-level or high-level clouds, and the percent of coverage that uh, appears, and I make an estimate at each level. There's also an estimate of opacity, which has to do with how dark the clouds seem, whether they're high and thin and the sun can easily get through, or maybe they're not so thin, and you can maybe see where the sun is a little bit, and maybe they're way just way too thick to see any sun at all, and they'd be more opaque. So you would make also, um, an estimate on opacity. And, well, you might say, I have plenty of days where there's no clouds in the sky at all. Why do I even need to make an observation then? Well, what's important is, obviously, the Earth receives energy from the sun, and it radiates it back. If clouds are in the way, maybe some less energy gets radiated back. But if there's no clouds, certainly scientists are still interested in knowing how much energy gets radiated back off the ground, back to the satellites or back into the atmosphere. So it's helpful to know whether there's leaves on the tree or not, whether it's dry or not on the ground, whether there's snow or ice, is it raining, is it snowing? All of this is very valuable data, just as valuable as the estimate of clouds in the sky that are made. So if you make these observations, does it end there? Well. Certainly, of course not. Now, for me, this is kind of where the fun is because once and Larry, I just wanted to tell you we we have about a minute, so tell us about the fun. Okay, <laughs> certainly, the fun is the match emails at the end. Well, you'll get a retrieval of what the satellite estimated.
or what the cloud cover was, and you're able to compare that with your estimates. And you can also leave comments for the scientists by way of the match email and replying to that. So my closing message is become a citizen scientist. Visit the GLOBE website, uh, get the training, ask questions, become involved. The scientists are really interested in hearing from this ground-based perspective. Thank you so much. Okay, Darlene. Hey, Larry, that was great. And I'm really happy that you brought a citizen scientist perspective. For it. And I'm also happy that nobody ever called the cops on you while you were out wandering in the park with your, with your camera <laughs> facing up. Thank you for the injection of humor and super informative firsthand look at what it's like to be involved in a GLOBE program as a, you know, a senior citizen and, and above. And he did it. Thank you for your contributions too, Larry. It really matters. All right, Mike, we're going to toss it to you. All You're right. On. Hi, all. I've got about a decade on Dorian and Larry. I'm around 72 and a half. And you've all already picked up on this. Citizen science is truly rewarding. It's an opportunity to make contributions to scientific advancement, broaden your horizons, learn new things. You've already picked up on that. I started in 2006 with a Stardust at Home project, searching for interstellar dust particles. Uh, some of you caught Andrew Westfall's presentation on that yesterday. When I heard about it, I thought it was a really exciting opportunity for somebody like me with no astronomy background to help on a NASA project. And it was, but there was so much more to it. I'm not on social media, I'm old fashioned, but because of citizen science, I've learned some things about online forums. I've learned about chat boxes, how much fun and uh, informative they can be and also how annoying they can be. Uh, old hat for most of you, for me, it was something new. Uh, I learned about all sorts of other, I learned what those little ubiquitous hearts were all over the place. You know them as likes. That was something new for me too. Uh, after I gained experience and skill at dusting, I was recruited to something called a red team to help identify and rank the most promising interstellar dust particle candidates. Well, I went on Google and Googled red team and found out about NASA red teams, really neat. And now I was on one. On another project, I was asked to help other users answer questions for them, coach, provide advice, report on issues, just keep an eye on things. They knew I was already doing it. So I said, yeah, sure. And then they put a star by my user's name and I felt like a snitch from Dr. Seuss. Uh, later on, I found out that this indicated I was an official moderator. Well, I had heard of moderators, but I wasn't really sure what they were. Now I was one. And so now I know what they are. Um, let me skip this here. I am a co-author on a paper with my friend from uh, Italy, Augusto. Uh, Dr. Westfall mentioned Augusto in his presentation yesterday. But aside from him, I have colleagues around the world. That's another advantage of citizen science, the interaction, the camaraderie with other people. I, I know folks in Lithuania, Australia, Belgium, Morocco, Germany, England, Uganda, Canada, that's a, he's a neat guy, <laughs> Virginia, other US states. And I know some of their hobbies, their families, something about their culture. They teach me about things beyond my kin, Australian desserts, famous graffiti artists, even manga and anime. Not all of that contributes to the science, but it contributes to me and it'll contribute to you too. And that's worthwhile. Uh, another project invited me to serve on a live panel discussion on Facebook. I'm not even on Facebook. They said, no problem. I, okay, fine. I did it. Didn't know how it was going to come out. Didn't think it came out that well, but I, when I watched it later, yeah, it was all right. But the one main thing I learned from that, it looks really silly when you dive into the, into the computer like this in order to speak into the microphone. You don't need to do that. That was something I learned. Um, let's see, on another project, I was competing with a, an AI bot or playing with it and uh, provided feedback then to the uh, folks at Cornell in this case on the bot's performance and how it was as a human to play with an artificial intelligence at the same time. Uh, and as of last week, folks, I don't even know, I don't even own a smartphone for, oh, I can't even say it, smartphone, there we go. I don't even own one, but I'm an official hacker now because last week I 
found a serious platform vulnerability in one of the other projects I work on. And uh, I promptly reported it, of course. And now they're fashioning a new hacker badge for me. So who'd have guessed that? I forgot to set my timer. So somebody's timing this, right? Um, Dr. Westfall mentioned I was going to talk about the Cornell project. I hadn't planned to, but since he's kind of my boss, I guess I'll just say that uh, it's important to recognize cross-fertilization. That's a thing in science. It's very important. And the Stardust project inspired a similar project over at Cornell where they were doing or are doing very good research on Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. They start studying uh, microcapillaries in live mouse brains and they needed a way to do that and get the citizen scientists involved in examining those images. And uh, uh, Pietro, Mr. Lushki, oh boy, I'm gonna, I've never said his last name out loud before, Libby apologized to him for me. Uh, but Pietro over at the Human Computation Institute, uh, he was a duster and he recognized that the virtual microscope technique that we were using on Stardust would be applicable for the capillaries in the mice brain. So long story short, that sped up the, uh, the uh, creation of this new project, which is called now stall catchers. And, um, and, and it happened a lot faster because of uh, Cornell collaborating with Berkeley and vice versa and getting that work going over there. And uh, you can be a part of all that. So as, as Larry said, just get involved. Uh, for most projects, there's zero experience required. Dedicate some of your time, try it, but just be forewarned, once you try it, you'll probably want to dedicate even more time. Um, that's about it. I just leave one last thought with you. Dr. Andrew Westfall likes to say, and he's quoting his own dad, who was a sit-sci pioneer, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Thanks for listening. Mike, that was amazing. Mike and Larry, you're incredible. Uh, Mike, you also pointed something. First of all, thank you for your talk and thank you so much for all that you're doing to help answer questions that uh, none of us can answer alone and for sharing your experiences. Mike, I have this vision of you as like a high tech hack now and uh, somebody who was able to do that without a smartphone or a Facebook account. It's amazing. And I hope that this is inspiring more of our uh, senior citizens who are listening in and those who are over 50 or so um, or just not comfortable with technology to realize like there's not a project that's not open to you. There are so many projects available to get involved in. You can see them on NASA's website. You can see them on scistarter.org forward slash NASA. And Mike, just to um, pick up on something that you just described, you gave a very good example of how you got involved in a project and you found your way to other types of projects. And that's not uncommon. Not only once you get involved, might you stay involved in that project, but what we found through SciStarter, a lot of people research the SciStarter platform to see what's happening in citizen science. We found that people get involved in three to five projects and they might be across different types of topics. You described one about stardust, you know, analyzing dust from space, and then you described your involvement, and I know you're heavily involved in a project that helps accelerate research about Alzheimer's. Two totally different platforms, one person helping to acceler accelerate research in very diff different fields. So thank you for sharing that. And that project again is called Stall Catchers, if anybody's interested in that one. Now we're gonna open it up to some more Q&A. Let's bring our, all of our panelists back online here. And let's see if we can pull some, let's see, if we have no open questions from Q&A and nine minutes to, to fill. Let me tell you, there are some questions here about certificates. And um, if you go to the, uh, yes, Kathy, I think citizen science is addictive too. Um, if you go to the 35 apps Kathy has on her phone, <laughs> citizen science apps, by the way, um, if you go to scistarter.org forward slash NASA, you're going to see a little blurb there that says you can earn a certificate. And that will be from our project team, which is SciStarter and the Citizen Science Association and NASA, as we're now partners here. Um, so the certificate, the way to get that is we'll email it to you once you attend two events. So if you've tuned in now, if you're one of the hundred and almost 60 people who have tuned in and are online here now, 
that's one event. You may have already tuned into some yesterday, but there's a whole bunch more coming up and you'll find them on that same website. And then get involved in one of the affiliate projects. That means we know if you've actually contributed to that project because those projects report back to us that you have. Get started, we'll send you a certificate. And that's the question to that, uh, that's the answer to that question that keeps coming up. Let's see, I saw a question in here about, oh, a lot of questions here since we have a global audience too about can they get involved if they don't live in the United States? I'm gonna ask Dorian to answer that one first and then Emily. What a great question and absolutely that to me is the huge strength of the globe program we have 125 different countries that are a part of of you know these these data collection and a part of this this global enterprise i did have one person reach out to me um, who lives in malaysia um, and i gave her my direct email address so that i can um, have her talk with whom she needs to to find out which government officials would need to set up that memorandum of op of understanding that cooperative agreement but I'm delighted to say that, yes, we have so many amazingly active members of our home planet who are contributing data, you know, day in and day out throughout the, the entire globe. And before we get to Emily, thank you for that, Dorian. We had a commenter who just said something that I was thinking. These are global issues. The clouds don't stop. Um, you know, all the things that you're looking at for global climate change as well. And also, of course, the satellites orbit overhead and the entire planet. It's not just the, the United States. So it does take all of us to be involved in this. And Dorian, I know also that it is not too difficult for a country that's not already listed to um, work with you, as you mentioned, to hopefully get listed as an improved um, country too. Absolutely. Great. All right, we're gonna change this over to Emily to answer that question. I saw a couple of times, I think the name of the project is throwing people and they assume that they have to live in Wisconsin to be involved. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I totally understand uh, why that would be confusing. But no, um, to our data is all from the state of Wisconsin in the US. Um, but to classify the photos, you can be anywhere in the world. Uh, you don't even have to be in the United States. Um, uh, if you weren't around for the, the demo, um, there's a field guide that will help you identify the Wisconsin animals. Um, and so, yeah, you don't even need to be familiar with all of the uh, various species that we have in Wisconsin. Um, so yes, all of the data is collected in Wisconsin, but does not, you don't need to be in Wisconsin to participate. Uh, and many of our um, results do affect Wisconsin managed species, but we do have collaborators at the University of Wisconsin who are working on things as you mentioned, things like climate change and um, an example is looking at green up and brown down at uh, sites across the year and how that might be changing as a result of things like climate change. Um, and uh, in the demo, I ended up with a snowshoe hair photo. So an example of why that might be uh, an important species to document um, would be because that species changes from brown to white in the winter time so that it blends in with the snow, has camouflage. Um, and with climate change, that may be changing. They aren't responding to the snow, they're responding to things like daylight length, which isn't going to change even if the temperature is warmer. So those are the sorts of questions that can be answered from our data uh, in addition to looking at things like wildlife management in the state. So yes, it's yeah. it's totally accessible to anybody in the world and hopefully uh, you can find some reasons for it to be um, uh, relevant to you no matter where you are also. Excellent, thank you, Emily. And then I'm gonna leave this, we have a question for Mike and a question for Larry and it's the same exact question. Um, can you just uh, remind us of how you, stumbled upon or learned about citizen science? And what was your very first project? Well, uh, in my case, I mentioned my first project was with the Stardust at home. And I've been involved with that steadily for the last 15 years. Mike, how did you learn about that? How'd you discover that? I read a blurb about it in uh, Chemical Engineering Progress. I'm a retired chemical engineer. And I thought, wow, that sounds really good. And I was getting ready to retire. And that uh, sounded like a great project. And so I got involved a few months before I retired and I've been involved with it ever since. 
Awesome. Now, yes, media mentions of citizen science opportunities are really important. So if we have any journalists on the line here, bloggers, others, spread the word. We need more people involved. Thank you, Mike. And Larry, may I ask you the same question? Your first project and how you learned about it. Actually, my first project is still the project I'm working on now, the uh, clouds protocol uh, in the atmospheric section. So the way I became interested or knew about this for years, I've been receiving a weekly e-newsletter from Earth, NASA's Earth Observatory. And in early 2015, there was an article about the school program, the, Citis, the Students Clouds Observation Online program. And I didn't need to be part of a school. I could report in as a rover. So I downloaded information, got trained on the clouds protocol back in early 2015, um, got trained on the same protocol for GLOBE in 2017, and I've been doing that ever since. So I started out with GLOBE, with clouds, and I continue with clouds. Well, I'm glad that you did. Thank you both for sharing your experiences with us, our project leaders as well. Remember folks, we really want you to get involved in these projects. It doesn't take much to get started. And once you get started, you can see how um, welcoming the project scientists are. They're gonna answer questions that you have. They often have communities that can help you. They have tutorials and training guides. There's, there's something for everybody here. And actually speaking of um, trainings, so on that same page of scistarter.org forward slash NASA, off to the left, there's a little link there. If you're brand new to citizen science, there's a self-guided online training module you can, um, you can use introduces you, gets you through the steps, helps you build confidence in what citizen science is, how you can get involved, developed by our friends, the instructional designers at Arizona State University. So check out the training there. Okay, what's coming up next? We have, stick around for a plenary session with the Citizen Science Association, celebrating the science of millions, a conversation with the Zooniverse's Dr. Chris Lintot. That's happening in just 10 minutes. Then you have Science Near Me, NASA Citizen Science near me, showing you all the ways that you can get involved in local projects. That is going to be moderated by our friend Lydia. You're going to love her. Save our world with citizen science. We have a special librarian from Los Angeles who will tell us about all the ways you can engage in citizen science to help save the planet. And then really important, what's next after your citizen science project experience? We see a lot of questions coming in of like, so now what, can I get an internship? How do I use this for workplace advancement? What can I do now with all of this experience? What kind of other special resources or opportunities exist for me at NASA? This is the topic to tune into. You'll learn how some people have been published on peer reviewed journals and what else you can do to connect with NASA. And that looks like that's at 4.30 Eastern time. And then our big finale for the whole event is telescope time. While this is amazing, if you have a telescope, you can tune in. We have a special guest joining us showing you how you can access somebody else's telescope time to get involved in projects too. But we're really excited to have Vivian White from NASA's Night, Night Sky Network closing out our event at 5.45 p.m. So when you hang up, when you click off Zoom or end your session here, you're going to see a little poll come up. Stick around and just fill out those couple of questions. It'll help us know how we're doing and get started at scistarter.org forward slash NASA. And let's all become citizen scientists. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy your day. Thank you. And you can find the link for the next session on scistarter.org forward slash NASA. See you all there.